When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth Shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make Shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to Tea Break Time Travel, where every month we look at a different archaeological object and take you on a journey into their past. Hello and welcome to episode 15 of Tea Break Time Travel. I'm your host, Matilda Siebrecht, and today I'm savouring a strawberry tea. Very seasonally appropriate, at least here we're nearly out of the strawberry season. And joining me on my tea break today is archaeologist Femke Reitzma. And are you also drinking a, a seasonally appropriate tea or have you gone the more traditional route? I don't know about that, but I'm drinking an iced matcha. Oh. Which I, is, my, yeah, I love that in the summer. Okay, that sounds very exotic. I admit, yeah. I've tried a matcha latte once and I just couldn't. It, oh, it was, yeah. You no. need to source the, this is going to sound extremely pretentious. You <laughs> need to source really high quality matcha. Otherwise, it's just tastes like chalk which is yeah. awful yeah yeah okay, okay um, but good. once you do I, I can highly recommend it's a good coffee alternative that doesn't give you the jitters ah uh, well that's because it was some i to be fair now i'm thinking about it the only time i've tried it i think was when we were having a long drive and we stopped at a you know gas station thing oh, and oh no got the matcha <laughs> latte because i didn't want to have a coffee and i thought that sounds nice everyone always goes on and on about how nice matcha is and then it was disgusting but that probably explains why it's so yeah i mean that happened to me a few times before i found the nice stuff okay oh okay oh no oh dear does that mean i have to go shopping for some nice matcha tea what a shame Uh, (laughs) i can i can share the 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 website that i order it from now (laughs) and is it like a powder thing that you add or is it like a tea so it is ground green tea leaves okay Okay. that i think are grown in the shades in japan like a specific very specific conditions um and then you mix it in with uh, the right temperature water it's very sensitive okay (laughs) and then you you whisk it with one of those like bamboo whisks the little thing so it becomes a bit frothy Uh yeah it's a it's a fun process also well that's the nice thing right and that's also that's why i use loose tea pretty much all the time now because it's just such a nice little kind of, you know, ritual. Um, they're they're yeah. allowed to use the word ritual as an archaeologist. It's a nice little morning <laughs> ritual um, to yeah. just, yeah, have the tea and set it up and do the kettle. Start your day. And, yeah, so I can imagine. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Huh. Good to know. Good to know. Okay, well, there you go. We've, we've learned something new already. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> I had no idea about what matcha was supposed to taste like or what it really was. But uh, uh, even though we uh, both love tea, we are not here to talk about tea. We're here to talk about uh, your speciality, shall we say, in archaeology, mm-hmm. which we'll get to in a moment. But first of all, I always like to ask my guests how they first became involved with archaeology, because so far we have had no two similar answers. Everyone has a very different path. So I think it's nice to show the, the diversity. So what was your entrance into the field of archaeology? So I think my, my journey with archaeology uh, started when I was quite young. So I always knew I wanted to be a scientist because I wanted to understand the world around me. And then I remember going on holiday with my parents to France as a kid, and we visited an archaeology museum, and I loved it. Um, And then in the area surrounding the museum, there was an ongoing excavation of some Roman stuff. And then I just realized, wait, these people do this for a living? (laughs) If this is a thing you can do, then that's what I want to become when I grow up. So then uh, in the years following that, I looked into what archaeology was and I got super excited because it mixes the humanities and the natural sciences. And I always had an interest in both and I kind of didn't want to choose. And then I thought that I would get into late prehistory because that seemed super fun. And that's what, what you what I saw most at museums. And then as soon as I arrived at university, I absolutely fell in love with human evolution. So that's the, the route I took. And uh, the rest is history or, or rather pre-history. prehistory. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and see, if you're listening in and you also immediately thought of that horrible joke, then you are in the <laughs> right place. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> only downhill the- from here in terms of puns. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, uh, and 
I find that really fascinating indeed that you mentioned already that archaeology is the mix between kind of humanities and, and natural sciences, because I feel like most people don't really think of it like that. They think of it more as kind of an extension of of history. But so you yeah. were also always interested in in the scientific aspect from the start, or did you kind of try to find the science, if that makes sense? So I was interested as a kid, I was interested in biology and physics and that sort of stuff. But yeah, it took me a, a bit of uh, diving into archaeology to find where I could uh, satisfy that interest, mm. so to say. But l- luckily, there's lots of scientific techniques that are being being used. And and those disciplines like biology and geology also play an important role, especially in human evolution studies. Yeah. And I think it depends so much as well on which, for example, when you're starting out and you're studying like which uni you go to, because I was at Aberdeen Uni for my undergrad and there the archaeology courses and, and the archaeology department was in with the geology department, for example. Like that's mm. how they they classified them as like the geosciences. Whereas I feel yeah. like in a lot of other ones, they're with, like in Groningen, they're with the humanities department, you know. So it's Yeah. Kind of and then in Leiden, we're a separate faculty where there's a bit of an identity crisis. This is because incredible. Some, I mean, it is. It's, <laughs> it, yeah, it's amazing. I think it's also the only uh, archaeology faculty in, I think, in Europe, something like that. I think so too, yeah. yeah. But yeah, so we have more theoretical archaeologists. We have the, the sort of hardcore sciences part and, and basically everything in between. Yeah. Which is really nice. Yeah. Which, and I love as well, because I also, for, for those of you in, I met Femke at Leiden University, indeed. That is how I uh, I got to know of her research. And I love that, indeed, you could sort of sit down in the cafeteria and then have a chat with people who were doing the same stuff as you, but they were doing completely different stuff. So, you know, everyone was doing their master's thesis, but everyone was doing it in a completely different topic. Like one person was doing uh, teeth dating techniques and I was doing amber bead making and uh, Femke's yeah, burning things. Um, so it was uh, <laughs> a, a very interesting uh, mixture of, uh, of... Yeah, I find that super inspiring because, yeah, you, you get to interact with people who do something that is way outside your specific... Um, specialization. Yeah, definitely. And it also just proves the whole thing that when people ask, oh, you're an archaeologist, so where do you like digging? And you're going, it's not all about digging. (laughs) I spend lots of time in labs, which is also fun, but sometimes you have to get outside. (laughs) Yeah, true. I I do that with my experimental archaeology. So then I get, I get uh, both (laughs) without, without needing to do the whole, (laughs) I must admit, I've spoken on this before about this. uh, I think probably people listening will hate me because uh, I, I'm not the, (laughs) I I like field work in its place occasionally in the sun on a nice cool day. Yeah, (laughs) Um, That's the benefit of academic uh, field work. Mostly, I guess you also to the arctic yeah. but we tend to do this in the summer when the weather is nicer it's nicer yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, anyway good okay <laughs> um so sorry i got a bit carried away there. i just i think that it's very important to highlight that archaeology has so many different facets and different topics within it um and we will talk about this more in uh, the third section as well but uh, of course this is a time travel tea break so if you could travel back anywhere in time where would you go and why uh, so this is this is always a bit of a difficult question for me because human evolution covers such a vast time span. But I'm currently working uh, on a paper where we explore different hypotheses about the earliest active use of fire. So I think right now I would want to, to travel back about uh, one and a half million years ago to see how Homo erectus uh, might have interacted with fire. I think that would be really fun. Yeah. Oh, and we'll, okay. Well, hang on. I'll save that. <laughs> we'll talk about that again in a minute <laughs> but, right. uh, because uh, I think that relates a lot to uh, some of the discussion points that I have for uh, for section two. But uh, thank you very much for joining me uh, on this uh, tea break today. And we are going to do some time traveling indeed. Before we sort of talk a little bit more about Femke's uh, specialization, we're journeying back not quite that far. We're going back around 50,000 years Night is falling, the sound of cicadas fills the air, accompanied by the occasional rumble and roar of various wild animals in the distance. Nearby, there's a group of figures huddled around a spot on the ground. It's unsure exactly what kind of figures they are, crouching low to watch one of the group in his activities. We creep lower to see what's happening and catch sight of a spark leaping from a piece of flint that is struck down with a loud ringing ping. Another strike, another spark, a grunt of frustration from the individual who adjusts the small bundle of dry grass piled carefully below his hands. A few more strikes and suddenly a spark hits true and a tiny plume of smoke rises into the air. 
The group makes noises of excited encouragement as the finger lifts the smoking bundle of grass and caresses it in his hands, blowing it until a bright orange flame flickers into life, piercing the ever-darkening sky. So today we are looking at fire, which is a bit of a contentious one for this podcast because technically I suppose it's not really an artifact, <laughs> but that is something that we will also be discussing further uh, in the next section. So we will get to that soon. But first, let's have a look, as always, at the most asked questions on the internet, courtesy of Google Search. And this was particularly difficult this time because trying to put in fire, what fire, where fire, are fire into Google search comes <laughs> up fire. with very random results that are completely <laughs> unrelated to this podcast. But I thought that these might be slightly relevant. So maybe you can still help with these. So mm -hmm. the first question, um, yeah, was what is fire, which I guess, fair enough. What what actually is fire? Yeah, that's a, I think that's a, a good question to start with. So fire is a chemical reaction between heat and organic fuel and oxygen. It requires an input uh, of sufficient heat to reach the ignition temperature of the fuel. Uh, and once ignited, the organic components of the fuel are transformed into carbon-rich char. So think of charcoal that you put on your barbecue. Um, and during this process, CO2 and other gases are released. And when enough oxygen is available, the char and those gases uh, will oxidize, creating the characteristic glowing embers and the flames. Yeah, so that's that's what fire is. So the, the, the sort of color that you see is the basically the chemicals, the thing one turning into thing two kind of thing. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, nice. Excellent. Perfect. And then the... Uh, the, you know, well, the next question kind of relates to this because it's, well, both of the next questions relate to this actually. And they are, why is fire blue and what fire is the hottest? And because indeed you have, depending on the heat of the fire, it seems to change color all the time. So what what's what's the deal with that? Basically? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the main thing relating to fire color is indeed temperature, which then relates to the completeness of the combustion uh, process and the efficiency of the fuel. And as people might know, there's different fire colors. With increasing temperature, you have red, orange, yellow, white, and blue. And the, But the color also relates to the composition of the fuel. So for example, if you add uh, some copper into the process, then you get green flames. So by adding different chemicals, you can also create different colors. Um, and this is what happens in uh, fireworks, for example. Oh, I see. So temperature and different chemicals. Okay, yeah. Which, I mean, and that's also all very scientific, <laughs> but I guess there's, there's... Yeah, there's no way around it. Yeah, yeah. But indeed, it's nice that almost the, the different colors are, are a nice visual aid as well, I suppose, for people in the past, for example, who yeah. would have needed fire to be able to tell how hot something... Yeah, and I mean, of course, they didn't put a temperature label on it, but I, I think they knew that if we want to do this task, we need the fire to look like this. Mm -hmm. And then they knew how to achieve that. Yeah, which, yeah, because it's, it's so for fire, you basically need then organic component, oxygen, he, heat, I assume, of, of some sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so that, it's, that's, it's the, called the fire triangle. So those are the three essential uh, okay. components. Okay, perfect. And how would the heat have been created? Because I mean, so I had in the time travel, you had sort of a piece of flint, for example. I've also heard of, of like the drills being is that something that that could have been used I, this is what i yeah. see on on lots of youtube videos but uh, i'm not sure myself <laughs> so if you want to use uh, flint you need also need a piece of pyrite or marcasite uh, which is an iron oxide um, that creates the spark so you strike that material with the flint and then you kind of detach really small pieces and in the sort of the heat that is involved in the strike you produce sparks that then you need to aim at the, the tinder to actually get that to ignite, which is more difficult than you think. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to go a different route, then there's fire drills, which is indeed a piece of wood that you try and drill into as fast as possible into a, a, a wooden board, sort of a baseboard, where you then create with the friction, you create sort of a, a bit of a, a small ember that you then put on a on, on your Tinder material. Ah, I see. So you've already and there's kind of increasing, created a little bit of uh, burning. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there's increasing complexity in the type of, you have, you have a fire drill, you have a fire bow, and there, there's some other things. Um, fire production is not necessarily my specialization, so I'm <laughs> sure there's there's more tools out there that you could use that are used in bushcraft or mm. uh, used by uh, uh, extent hunter-gatherers. Uh, yeah. But yeah, this is sort of the, the basic the basic options. Yeah, which is just so fascinating because indeed it's it's one of those things that then – Yes, you need the the triangle, uh, the you know uh, what was it? Oxygen, organic matter, heat. But then to create the heat, mm-hmm. you also need the perfect tools or the perfect combination. And I imagine when things are wet, yeah. it also doesn't really work. So yeah. The- so the the benefit of using flint and pyrite is that at least your tools are don't get so wet. You can right. easily dry them because the 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 moisture doesn't go into the tools, right? Mm. But if you use wood, yeah, then you're you're in some trouble. And would, I mean, you've, li- you've literally just told me that this is in your area of specialization. So I apologize if, if you no, don't yeah, get the answer no, to this one. No worries. But would the pyrite, for example, I mean, is that commonly found everywhere or would there have then been locations where it was just not environmentally possible to make fire or yeah. Do, do we know about that? <laughs> do, do so. Uh, I know that there's particular areas where it's found in abundance and then there's other areas uh, where it's more scarce. So okay. people would have would have had to look for the material and then assess the quality. So it might it might have been more difficult uh, to produce fire in certain areas. Uh, but what you can also do if you have the fire, either created by production or because you took it from a natural source, if you make sure that you keep it going, you can transport those little embers and then just start a new fire in a different location. I've heard about this because wasn't this something with Otzi, they, the Iceman that was found yeah. in Austria or something? They, yeah, but, but he also had a, a fire starting kit on him. Oh, okay, okay. But because, I mean, the embers, but how, <laughs> again, I'm asking you these random questions, but, um, because surely I'm just thinking of it. I mean, nearly all material that they would have used back then, unless they've made like a stone or I guess a pottery thing to carry them in. But surely the embers would just burn through anything that, that they carry it in. Yeah, I mean, I don't fully understand how this would have worked either. <laughs> but I mean, there are there are hunter gatherers who do this and there are even groups that knew how to produce fire that then lost the ability to okay. do that, but still still are using fire. Okay, interesting. Oh, see, it's, uh, yeah, that's where I, I think that's where I need to go back in time to, to just <laughs> see what the first people worked out how to do that. They were like, let's just yeah, take this with yeah. us. Oh, it burns through that. Oh, what about this? Oh, it burns through that as well. Okay, well, this works. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe they they just needed to time it right. This is wrapping up in in lots of organic materials, and then (laughs) run. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But by the by the time it starts to burn through your pouch, this is where you have to set up camp. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Once the fire starts, then then you can stop. Yeah, yeah. The fire dictates where you go. Yeah. Oh, it has even more agency than we think (laughs) in uh, dictating (laughs) the lives of people. So, okay, well, so uh, we're getting into into section two territory now. So I think. uh, We'll have a very quick break, but we will be back soon. So welcome back, everybody. So we know a little bit more about fire itself, but uh, Femke, as you are here as our fire human evolution expert, maybe you could tell us even more about it uh, in relation to that. So when I was researching this to try and make the little time travel segment, I did find it very hard to discover exactly when the earliest evidence for fire actually is. So I think even in the original one, it sort of said 1.5 million years, but then we were chatting and you said, "Mm, not so sure, because somewhere else said 50,000 years indeed, and that's what I put in. But so when is the earliest evidence that we have (laughs) for for fire use or, you know, what's the discussion around that? Because it sounds like quite a complicated topic. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And there is still a lot of discussion about the um, the earliest use of fire and also about what that then looked like. So if you if you take a certain definition, then maybe it goes back in time to date X. But then if you take a different definition, it becomes younger or even much older. Oh. So the earliest association of fire traces with human behavior, so to say, those uh, date to uh, 1.5, 1.6 million years ago, and they're found in Africa at a few different sites. There's still a bit of discussion about whether that's natural fire, whether these hominins, so in this case, mostly Homo erectus, were actually using the fire or maybe not. 
it, yeah. So it's important to make sure that the evidence you find is actually heated materials. Then you have to figure out um, if it's anthropogenic fire use or natural fire. So that makes the earliest evidence a bit complicated. Then when you go to a slightly younger periods, but still super old, I guess, for every other type of archaeology, the evidence becomes a bit more easy to interpret and also a bit more widespread and a bit more solid. So in Europe, good evidence for fire use, like regular widespread fire use, goes back at least to 400,000 years ago. There is also some earlier stuff in Europe, but that is more contentious. And then fire production, which we talked about earlier, uh, is very difficult to trace in the archaeological records. And the earliest evidence for that dates to around 50,000 years ago. Okay, so we see the fire in the archaeological record at the 400,000 years ago, even before, but it's unsure whether they were actually creating it at that point. Yeah. Okay. And there's, so there's different earliest evidence for also in different regions. Okay. But we know that, for example, 400,000 years ago, they were using the fire. What's the sort of, yeah, what, what are the, the signs that can tell us that? So you trace fire in the archaeological record by uh, looking for what we call fire proxies. So that's anything that's affected by heat um, left behind by the use of fire. If we're lucky, then that preserves in the, the shape of a hearth, which then makes it very easy to recognize and also to identify that it's uh, human made and used. If preservation is less favorable, then we have to work with scattered ash, charcoal, heated bones, some heated lithics, biomolecules in the soil. And then the puzzle becomes a bit more complicated because you have to put those things together and make sure, again, that they're actually heated uh, and that they relate to human behavior. Okay. And so what else could cause those? If it, if it wasn't heated, what else could have happened there kind of thing? So there's certain soil processes that could also stain, for example, bones. So then they would look black, but they're not actually heated. And for organic, other organic materials like plant material, humification, uh, which is a part of a process in soil formation, uh, which you want if you want to grow plants, that sort of thing, also creates the, um, the, the look of early charring. But then it's again, it's not actually heated. And there's oxidation processes in sediments that make, make it look red, which has to do with iron instead of heating. So there's, there's quite a bit of processes that result in the same visual characteristics. But then if you take a more closer chemistry look at it, then you'll find that it's not actually heated. And do you then find that there's quite a lot of evidence, shall we say, in inverted commas, from kind of previous years of research where they didn't maybe use these scientific method, methods that now have been disproven? Uh, or, well, obviously you can't disprove anything uh, in archaeology, but as in the, the evidence at least has been shown to not actually be evidence for fire because it was it looked like it, but it wasn't chemically viable. Does that yes. make sense? Yes. <laughs> That's especially the case for material that was excavated in, let's say, the 50s and the 60s. Yeah, because, yeah, those techniques, they were available, but not as widely used. And some of that, the, especially the, the more contentious, very early sites have been found to, to not actually involve uh, heating. And a, a more famous, I guess, maybe only in my field, uh, <laughs> example is the, uh, the site of Schöningen in Germany, where they also find those, found those famous spears and a bunch of butchered animal remains. Um, and also what originally was presumed hearth features there. They were round, they were red, there was material sticking out of it. Uh, it, it looked like it had charcoal and they, the original excavators sort of preserved them in the spot to wait for more uh, elaborate techniques to become available to really check if they were heated. And then <laughs> someone did uh, about 10 years ago, uh, and she actually found that they were not hearths. They oh. were <laughs> the formation of other soil processes like uh, oxidation, uh, the iron content, and some um, humification of materials. And the, so there were some bones in there as well, and th they were just not heated at all. 
Oh, okay. So, oh, no, well, yeah, so, so disappointing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because that would have, yeah, would have been really cool to have something that old yeah. really be, and also something that really looked like a hearth. So even with those, you sometimes yeah. have to be careful. Indeed, because, so a hearth is generally like a, like a pit in the ground, or I mean, what what's the sort of general identifying features, would you say? They can also be, so a, a fireplace can be built uh, on a flat surface, so you then in that case, you'll see a sort of a um, spherical signature in the, uh, in the sediment of uh, reddened soil. And then uh, there's a layer of, of char, which is the, the charred plant material that was in or on the surface of the, that what the fire was built on. Yeah. Then a layer of ash, which relates to uh, either the fuel or burning of the topsoil. And then there might be some some charcoal and stuff in there. Maybe there's some stones around it. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes people indeed dug shallow pits or deeper pits that then are filled with uh, heated material. Which I guess is the same as you'd see on like a campsite nowadays, <laughs> like if people have yeah. kind of tidied away their fire. So I suppose it's one of those things that just hasn't really changed. You know, there's only so many ways to build a path, I suppose. Yeah. And not to get too technical again, but if you if you think about fire as the application of heat energy, then there's different types to contain that heat and also different types to spread heat. And one type of fire is not necessarily more efficient, or I get I should say one type of campfire is not necessarily more efficient at radiating that heat than a different type. So that might actually indicate uh, cultural choices rather than functional ones. Interesting. So there's typologies, fire typologies. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. relates a little bit to another question I had, because uh, indeed, some people might be listening in and thinking, why are they talking about fire? I thought that this podcast was about archaeological objects and things <laughs> in the past. But the reason that we are having this particular episode is because, as I say, I know Femke um, from Leiden, and we were having a chat about my podcast, and she was saying, well, fire's an object. And I was going, is it? <laughs> she said, yes, of course it is. So I thought we could unpack that a little bit um, on here. And I thought, indeed, it's a it's an interesting concept. I mean, what defines a, an archaeological artifact? So f- to you, fire is indeed an artifact. Yeah, I, th- I think it's both a chemical, it's definitely a chemical process, right? But yeah. I also think it's an artifact. And uh, for the purpose of this question, I googled <laughs> the definition of an artifact. So according to oh, excellent. We diction- love that. <laughs> dictionary.com, which uh, to be fair is not an archaeological source, but <laughs> this is, I guess, the generally accepted definition of an artifact. Mm-hmm. It said, Something made or given shape by a human being, such as a tool or a work of art. I like that they mentioned that. Uh Especially an object of archaeological interest. And then it also says anything man-made. And I think this already supports my argument that fire is an artifact. Because it's not, like you said, it's not an object per se. Or at all. (laughs) Well, although you can carry it around with you, apparently. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That that might be the definition of an object. Yeah. (laughs) But it is definitely a tool that is used for lots of different things. Uh, And when it's actively used, it's shaped by humans. Mm -hmm. It's eventually also produced by humans. When it preserves as a recognizable feature, like a hearth, it can be classified in terms of typology, like other artifacts. Exactly, as we were just saying, yeah. And then as with other artifacts, we want to know how it was made and what it was used for. So I think that that makes it an artifact. Yeah, I, I mean, you've persuaded me. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, and like you say, it's a tool, right? It, in a way, so yeah. sort of uh, something. Although that does then... Oh, there's a couple of things. Okay. So, <laughs> so, okay. Maybe first of all, because you just mentioned it. So we've already talked quite a bit about how it was made, but how indeed would it have been used? Do you think by, for example, those earliest, uh, I think you mentioned Homo erectus, um, I guess also Homo, Neand- Homo neanderthalus would have been using it. And then of mm-hmm. course, Homo sapiens. So how was, uh, can we identify what it was used for basically? <laughs> Ah, so yes, it's a, this is a great question. And also one that's still very hotly, pun not <laughs> intended. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they just it's hot, hotly coming. debated. It sparked <laughs> debates. Yeah, no, there's ed, no, there's endless puns. It's terrible. And my apologies to all listeners. And anyway. They're loving it. <laughs> 
So based on ethnographic studies and also modern use of fire, we know that it's it can be used for lots of different things, right? So it can be used for cooking. It can be used to provide light. It can be used to provide heat. It can be used to ward off insects or predators. It's used uh, in ritualistic settings. It's used as a tool to shape and produce other materials. Mm, okay. uh, and all of those, most of those things also apply to the past. There's also sociological evidence or evidence studies that show that um, sitting around a campfire has a calming effect on people. So it lowers your blood pressure and then it makes people more social. I have no idea how that works, but this is what those studies (laughs) show. What was that science? Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then I'm not a sociologist. (laughs) And then there's also it's been suggested that it played a role in the development of language. Some of those functions are easier to identify uh, in the archaeological record than others because the development of language obviously does not leave physical traces. No, not until history. And I, we assume that they were speaking, I guess, a lot earlier than they started. <laughs> yeah. Stuff. yeah. But some of these other things you, you might be able to, to directly trace. So step one is finding evidence for fire. Mm-hmm. And then from there you would want to if we go back to fire being the application the fire use being the application of heat energy to a specific task you'd want to know what the characteristics of that fire were because cooking requires a different temperature than uh, let's say iron working I, iron yeah iron smelting yeah, you wouldn't want to cook your chicken at the temperature that you're melting it no no definitely not there w- would be no chicken left um <laughs> <laughs> and then a fire that needs to provide light need fl- needs flames, whereas, again, a cooking fire is more glowing embers. And then if you want to produce tar as an adhesive, then you need an, a reducing environment. So an environment that is almost depleted of oxygen. Mm, okay. So if you are able to reconstruct the characteristics of a fire, so the temperature and the oxygen availability, then that might give you clues as to what it was used for. Oh. Yeah. And then the other thing you could do is look, obviously look at the context because there's other evidence for human behavior around this evidence of fire, hopefully. Right. Yes. <laughs> Bring that in. Um, and then also maybe look for biomolecules in the soil because they might be related to processing of plants rather than animals. And I worked on a um, on material from a site in France where they had preserved hearths that dated back to the Aurignacian and the Gravettian, so that is 40,000 years ago to, uh-huh. let's say, 25,000 years ago. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then we saw that in certain periods, there was there were more biomolecules related to animal material. And then in other periods, uh, all of a sudden that changed, or all of a sudden, it changed. <laughs> Overnight. <laughs> Ten thousands of years. It, it changed to a signature that was uh, much more dominated by plant material. Mm-hmm. Now, that you can speculate what this means, but something changed, and that might have to do with the way they used those hearths. Okay. Huh. Which makes sense. I mean, that's sort of like so many things that you have, I guess, or, well, I suppose with us, it's sort of different. I'm trying to think of a modern comparison in terms of like what's in the kitchen, <laughs> like, you know, the oven, but I guess the ovens have changed as well. But, uh, well, but then I guess if it's like a gas oven or an electric oven or an induction thing, you know, at the stovetop, I mean, then maybe you'd, you'd approach things in different ways or you'd make things in different ways. No, I don't think, I don't think I'm making sense. <laughs> well, just... and, and as with an oven, which I think is, I mean, it is again, the application of heat to yes. a specific task. Uh-huh. It's used for different things. Yeah. I mean, we tend to only put food in it, but it's different types of food. You might bake a cake and then the next day you might roast a chicken. Right. Yeah. And it's, even, it's, my daughter has one of those little heat animal things, you know, that you can put like, usually we put it in the microwave, but technically it says on the label, you could put it in the oven at like a very, very, very low temperature and it will like be nice and warm for her to cuddle. Yeah. <laughs> or like, like ba- I remember as a kid, I had these, you could cast like gypsum into a mold and then that had to somehow be low temperature <laughs> baked. Oh, and then you beans. could like paint paint those yeah those and yeah. or paint those yeah, yeah. figurines 
yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, the, the other point I was uh, Sorry, going to yes. make is, <laughs> no worries, um, is that l- like ovens, f- fire in the past or a hearth in the past would have also been used for all of those tasks mm-hmm. in sort of the same location for an extended period of time. Yeah. So that makes it a bit more difficult. Right. Yeah, so yeah. really pinpoint one type of behavior. So it's not like they had a chicken cooking oven and, a, I don't know, copper working up. Well, I guess they would have had different ovens for copper working, but like a, I mean, a salad cooking yeah. oven or something. <laughs> salad. Why do you, you don't cook up a salad in an oven? You know what I mean. <laughs> you could stir, stir fry some courgette and exactly. put it in your salad. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, in, in later periods, the younger periods, uh-huh. eventually uh, technology became a bit more specialized. So then you would have cooking cooking ovens and uh-huh. uh, pottery uh, kilns and uh, iron smelting. I guess they're also called kilns. See, this is where I get confused because it's outside yeah. of my human evolution. Uh, fairness, that's the word right? I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there we go. Think. It's also probably different in every language. Like, which yeah. Ones, uh, which, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> which again relates to it relates to temperature but yeah. yeah if you if all you have is a hearth and even if it's a, if it's a simple hearth yeah then you'd use that for all these different applications and yeah. you'd use it for the entire duration of your occupation of a certain area yeah, yeah um, and sense. maybe when you're on the hunt or when you're foraging you might quickly use a start a fire to cook your lunch which they, they do have ethnographic evidence for it's very quick um, or modern, I think it's aboriginals that just like quickly start a fire to light a cigarette and then move on. Oh, wow. And so that's a, maybe something to consider for the archaeological record as well, right? So yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we tend to focus on sites that have a lot of evidence for occupation, but there mm-hmm. might be evidence for human behavior scattered throughout the landscape uh. that we're missing. Oh, which, I mean, that's the case in so many aspects of archaeology, yeah. right? There's so many things out, yeah. out there, potentially. Um, I did have a, one other question related a bit to what we were saying before. So when we were originally talking about it being potentially 1.5 million years ago, and you mentioned that was with Homo erectus, and then, yeah, the, since then there's been quite a few different human species. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what they all are, but hopefully you can uh, enlighten us. But so... Do we know that they would have been, or, or or do we imagine that they would have been using it for different purposes as well? Because, for example, when I picture Homo erectus, I remember they were the the tool makers, right? They were the, the first mm-hmm. tool makers. No, um, but that's and, originally that's Homo habilis. Homo habilis. Um, <laughs> but then now the the first uh, accepted, I guess, maybe not by everyone, tools date back to I think three million years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's like. Uh, that's way, way, way yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. crazy, like twice as And then far. it's yeah. a bit unclear what species that uh, is actually associated with because, yeah, you need, if there's multiple species around at a specific time, hmm. you really need human remains associated with the tools to be absolutely sure. Yeah. And even then, uh, it's it might just have called, been. It's cause for discussion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But but anyway, can we see that? Because I think I, I don't know. I can imagine it also for many people listening in. Maybe you sort of have this assumption of, for example, Homo erectus, and yes, maybe they were using tools, but it was sort of they're still walking around naked and they're eating raw meat and they're you know <laughs> all of this. It's that the classic you know stereotype of the kind of caveman you know look or whatever is. Is that the case, or do we know that they were, for example, using fire to cook? Um, so, because of because the evidence for Homo erectus is quite contentious, there's not a lot of agreement on even if if they used fire, let alone right. what they would be using fire for. Mm. There are, however, a bunch of theories, and the the, the main and most well known one. Uh, it's also been in popular science books, so maybe some of the listeners will recognize this, is linking Homo erectus fire use to cooking food that then would have facilitated the brain growth that we see in that species, because there's a leap in... That does sound familiar. In, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then you need... So this is sort of a more evolutionary anthropology take on the on the subjects but then you need the archaeological evidence to support mm. that 
right. which is the bed. That's where it gets a bit more difficult. Right. But we could think of the earliest fire use as probably related to food, because um, if you think about other animals using or let's say making use of fire, there's there's a, bu- a bush fire uh-huh. and then there's certain birds that pick up uh, burning branches and drop them somewhere else so they can chase out prey animals and, and really? they become easier to catch. Yeah. Interesting. There are uh, reports of uh, other primates going to the location of a natural fire after it's extinguished and foraging basically for toasted nuts and uh, maybe some this is going to sound uh, a bit harsh, some toasted animal. <laughs> well, I mean, why yeah. not? We would. <laughs> I mean. So uh, if we imagine this happening around the time of Homo erectus, they would have observed maybe that same behavior, but they would have, I think the first thing they would have observed is the benefits in terms of food mm. that it gives you. Mm-hmm. So that that might mean that they would take the fire and then try to cook their food or maybe they would burn the landscape like these birds Mm -hmm. because then they would they would have access to the toasted nuts and the and the the (laughs) and the toasted (laughs) toasted animals um whenever they wanted yeah oh fascinating Um, yeah but i mean all of that is is quite hard to to prove especially landscape fire use um, which we also have at the graphic evidence for, yeah. Because of course it 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 looks the same as right. natural fires. Yeah. <laughs> so so you need a really good context to be able to again, say this yeah. is probably man-made landscape fire and not just a natural fire. You want a little note written being like Zog made this fire <laughs> or something. Yeah. And just like oh yeah, great, cool. <laughs> this was man-made. <laughs> I this reminds me of now this might be a bit of a dated theory but I, it reminds me of a theory that I read about recently where they were talking about the Anatols specifically and how they were uh doing almost seasonal fire use because indeed during the winter months uh, there wasn't as much naturally occurring fire and they weren't as able to produce fire themselves so it had to use the naturally created stuff so actually in the hearths that they see are only in summer and spring months is this still a a sort of theory that is rife within the um, kind of (laughs) archaeology community or is that a bit dated now it's it's definitely still promoted by the people who originally suggested Ah, it (laughs) got it (laughs) but it's a massive point of discussion at least within the the people the the, yeah the group of people that i work with there's some things that we need to consider for this evidence so what they what they found it's based on two sites where they indeed found abundant fire evidence in the warmer layers so where the climate was a bit nicer and then much less uh, or even no fire evidence for the layers that relate to a glacial period however this might also be an artifact of preservation because right. the 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 circumstances in the sedimentation and all of that and the process processes in the soil might have varied depending on the climate that the material was deposited in that that's one thing then there might be a, a factor of behavioral choices maybe they were i don't know starting to fire somewhere else or using them somewhere else or they that uh, could be all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. Had the scattered throughout the landscape fires that we discussed yeah. earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or because ne- Neanderthals are also cold adapted, maybe they decided not to use the fire to keep warm because that is also an assumption, right? That you would right. need the fire to stay warm in these glacial periods. Mm. But what if they were using it for someone something else? And keeping warm wasn't the main focus of their fire use. Right. And yeah. maybe they, I don't know, there was some sort of task that they did in warmer periods that required the fire and there was less of a need for that in colder periods. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. The thing about the fire production is that we then have to look for uh, evidence for it, right? So we want to find the tools. 
And, and one of my colleagues actually found those tools so, and lots of them associated with Neanderthals uh, at various sites in France mm-hmm. dating to 50,000 years ago. So we know that at least some Neanderthals in the same region were regularly producing fire. Oh, nice. Okay. And and the, the, so the fun thing about this evidence is that they used hand axes. Oh, which I guess was their their okay. yeah their oh. preferred multi-purpose tool anyway. Yeah. Instead of what you'd think about as like a strike light, where you have like a flake or um, a blade that you then use to strike it. So uh-huh. it, the evidence looks different than it looks in more recent periods, which oh. is potentially why it was up until that paper, quite difficult to trace it back in time. I mean, yeah. if you're not looking for the right evidence, you won't find it. Absolutely. Yeah. Which I mean, could again be the case with so many things, right? In yeah. archaeology, it's just yeah. that we don't know what it's supposed to look like or what it, what it yeah. looked like in the past. <gasps> yeah. And in terms of fire use, therefore, I think it's super important to keep that, that chemistry in mind, because if you understand the chemistry, you will understand, have a better understanding of what types of materials are left behind by specific types of fire and how well those different materials might preserve. Um, And then from that, we can start to make, to build hypotheses about the fire use instead of the other way around. Yeah. Amazing. Well, which leads us nicely to our next section, actually. So we will have a very quick break now so that uh, our listeners can have an opportunity to top up their tea, but we will be back soon. So welcome back, everyone. I hope that the teacups are now full and the biscuit jar emptier. So Femke, we did already introduce you a bit in the first section and how you got into archaeology, but I thought it might be interesting, especially with all this talk of science and the importance of looking for scientific evidence in archaeological research. We could go into a bit more detail about that aspect and also looking at kind of human evolution and that sort of deep history, shall we say. So, I mean, first of all, if we just go right, right back to the beginning, I mentioned already that, you know, a lot of people associate archaeology with digging and excavation, but you mentioned that you do a lot of lab work. Did you still start out as the kind of classic field archaeologist student, uh, shall we say, in that respect? Uh, Yeah, I definitely did a lot of, uh, I got a lot of excavation uh, experience throughout my studies, and I've done some excavations um, as well um, after graduating, which is nice to not fully lose touch with the actual context that the materials that I study come from. And I love excavating. I think it's it's amazing to really have your hands on on the context that the the materials come from and yeah, to be so close to the past, I guess. Yeah. And uh, indeed, that's a good point you mentioned in the, the context. And by context, perhaps you could sort of explain <laughs> very briefly what, what you mean by that, uh, just uh, in terms of archaeological. So it's sort of the direct association of physical objects or how, how would you describe context? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a good starting point. <laughs> so uh, to me, context is the, the combination of the, uh, the, the tools and the materials that uh, people in the past have left behind and the uh, natural environment that it then gets deposited in. So the, the, the geological setting, um, if you will. Which indeed we were just, we were talking, I just realized that we've talked a lot about context in this episode, but it hasn't actually been defined um, uh, anywhere. So it was probably good to mention it now. Yeah, sorry, everyone. But uh, I I think most people by now, if they've listened to this podcast for long enough, they they sort of uh, know the general uh, terminology. I can imagine it's very important Then you've mentioned a couple of examples where it's like, okay, we have this evidence, but if you look at the context, it means this or we don't have evidence, but if you look at the context, it does mean this. So would you say that it's still very important, even if you're doing lab-based scientific work to, like you say, keep your hand in with excavation? Or do you think that it's not necessary? I guess technically you don't have to do the excavating yourself if you do this type of research, but I do think it helps and at least to visit those sites, to, to see how the, where the evidence was found, how it spatially relates to other things because it does help you not get stuck in the chemistry and related to the, the, the bigger picture and the, the rest of the archaeological material. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. And as you say, the environment, such a, especially in the theme of fire, for example, the environment is such an important aspect as well, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And do you think, so uh, you're now kind of more involved in 
the archaeological science uh, aspect you mentioned that you always sort of wanted to get more involved with that in the beginning. Do you, this is something that I have never felt personally, but that might be because I'm a lab person. (laughs) Um, So as well. So I never had the feeling that like people who work in the lab are seen as less archaeological, if that makes sense, uh, than people in the field by the rest of the archaeological community. But as someone who had uh, experience with both, do, have you had that experience? Would you say that there's a little bit of an almost a stigma for archaeological scientists or lab work or post-excavation or whatever you want to call it? Not, not in, in my field, I would say, because uh, with human evolution studies, because so little in the grand scheme of things, evidence preserves the... Mm. the applying those techniques to get the most information out the the limited amount of evidence that we have has always been a thing mm. and the context is important the geological context is important it's important for dating those dating techniques are important the the processes that um, alter the context after things are buried become very important right the f- further back in time you go so I think for human evolutions, all of those humanities questions and uh, natural sciences techniques in very broad spectrum have always gone hand in hand. Mm. So I, I don't feel any stigma uh, towards that yeah. at all. I mean, I like I said, I've never had it either. It was just, I think I was chatting to some people or some people were introducing themselves as saying, oh, I'm a lab archaeologists don't hate me you know i know it's not proper archaeology and i was going wait what <laughs> yes it is what are you talking about it's uh, yeah yeah i mean it, it's a very important part of making sense of the of the field work side exactly uh, yeah and we we wouldn't be able to do the lab work if the field work didn't exist but we wouldn't be able to interpret the field if we don't have all of those lab techniques yeah. so yeah exactly yeah very yeah. complimentary indeed i think it's a nice yeah. way to put it it's uh you can't have one without the other in a lot of cases i think exactly uh, and yeah you mentioned especially with then kind of uh in looking at human human evolution so we've already talked a bit about how it's uh, can be different from from other regions in terms of it's just so far i mean it, it boggles the mind really like if i if you try <laughs> to think about it it's it's Wow, um, like I can't. I don't think I can really grasp <laughs> exactly. I think I read somewhere it was like Neanderthals had been around, had already been around for longer than we have been around so far before we came along, or something like uh, something <laughs> like that. Which you're like, wait, yeah. what? Like, that just doesn't make sense. But what do you find is is particularly different about that field of research compared to your experience in other kinds of archaeology? So I think what characterizes human evolution studies is that we ask really big questions about really big themes in human evolution with very little evidence. <laughs> I mean, if you compare that to later periods, and this is a discussion that I've had uh, with other archaeology where, where they were like, well, I don't know how, how this works. Is this reliable? Are you even able to say anything because you don't have any evidence mm. as compared to, let's say, the Roman period or... Right. Yeah. Late, late prehistory, the, the Iron Age, there's much more material, which some, sometimes also makes it a lot more confusing. But so this is me sort of poking <laughs> to the other side. <laughs> but if you have a limited amount of evidence, you have to get really creative mm. with how you tackle that. And I think this is why most of the application of natural sciences techniques start out in my field and then sort of gradually work their way into other sides of archaeology. Hmm. Yeah, because indeed it's sort of they they can really make a difference. I mean they can make, yeah. make a difference everywhere but they can really make a difference in yeah. uh, in looking at human evolution. Yeah. But also like like you said those time spans are they're difficult to comprehend. It's millions yeah. of years. I mean, yeah. We we get comfortable with it because that's all we do. Yeah. But you also have to realize that then the the margin of error and the resolution you have is it's 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 not great, or at least it's very different compared to later periods. Yeah. Um, so there are certain questions you won't be able to answer because you simply do not have the resolution for it. Yeah. Yeah. Though so there's a lot of it could be, <laughs> it could yeah. be this, but it could not be. Like we and don't I, even know if certain hearths are contemporaneous to the tools that we find in the same layer. Right. Because, because those layers might be tens of thousands of years. <laughs> yeah. Which, is just... which makes hearth a very hearth's a very interesting snapshot. 
because they might have been used for a long period of time, but yeah. not thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. although you never know, maybe, <laughs> maybe there is the the ultimate oven that, you know, is just perfect yeah. and people just <laughs> kept using it for thousands They're, of years. They are still using it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and I can imagine that that also makes it even more difficult. I mean, I find it bad enough and I do sort of, yeah, prehistory kind of latish prehistory, I suppose, is that whole idea that, you know, yes, they were still people, but at the same time, they lived in a completely different world than we do now, both kind of culturally and environmentally and all this kind of stuff. And so you have to, you know, remove yourself a little bit and any interpretations you make, you have to try and remove your modern bias, so to speak. And that's just looking at late prehistory humans, like I, like homo sapiens. But I can imagine if you're looking at other species of human and things like that, it gets, is it more difficult to sort of feel that connection? Do you feel like you're more, how, how, how to say, more removed, uh, kind of emotionally, shall we say, from the, <laughs> from the people you're looking at? Or would you say it's still, that's still an important factor, if that makes sense? <laughs> oh, I, that's a very good point. <laughs> I, so personally, I feel very connected <laughs> Okay. to the, the hominins we study because I love them and I love learning about them. And I think it's so cool that we can go so far back in time and really trace our, our origins. That being said, they are not, they're not us. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't know if the, if things worked the same way that th those are all assumptions, Yeah. but you also have to start somewhere. Yeah. So you have to keep this in mind, but not let it, limits your ability to study the past too much because otherwise we just won't get anywhere which is also just a problem in archaeology in general right that that whole thing of of I, I remember chatting to someone and they sort of said oh what do you love most about archaeology and I said oh what I actually love most is that we can never really know you know what mm -hmm. exactly happened and they were going well but huh like how can you how can you get any satisfaction then because surely if you can never know then you it's you never get that sort of sense of release you know of of being sure about something and i mean that's again just for late prehistory but again for, for human evolution and that kind of yeah pl pleistocene archaeology i guess it's uh, mm -hmm. even more the case <laughs> so my, my trick to balance it out um, to is, avoid completely mentally spiraling and going what does it yeah, all matter <laughs> and you, people might be able to guess this is focusing on the natural processes there you go. <laughs> because those are universal and you can measure them and you can understand them um, and then from there you can try and approach um, the archaeology and indeed we'll, we'll never be sure but we can get close maybe yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could say maybe uh, things things that might potentially or yeah. per perhaps <laughs> i mean and and science in general is aimed at finding the best explanation for something with the available evidence and then changing those explanations if new evidence comes available so yes. that it's that's no different for archaeology the only problem we have is that we cannot go back to check if it's actually true yeah. <laughs> or a ask anyone which is such a shame <laughs> yeah. it, it would be it, so useful it, to just know. if time travel was real yeah that would be great but then we might also all lose our jobs Exactly. I mean, the archaeology would be a bit obsolete then because yeah. every, everyone... We, do, we don't want that either. <laughs> no, exactly. Well, I think we can be safe in the knowledge that probably time travel will never be invented because surely we would have met someone by now. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that's... Yeah. You would, the time travel paradox. Right? You would think it was... Uh, that's that, that's the whole thing, no? <laughs> that, uh, if, you know, if ever anyone invents time travel, come back to this moment and say something and then... Yeah. Okay. okay, cool. That's fine. Um, but uh, I did have one kind of sort of final question on this topic because uh, indeed it's sort of a very specialized area that you're in now. Um, you know, it's human evolution, but it's looking at fire in human evolution and it's looking at the chemical processes of fire in human evolution. Um, what would you say are kind of the advantages and the disadvantages of such a specialization? Like, for example, do you think that you are now very much in that niche? Do you think that you could also then change to Roman archaeology tomorrow if you needed to. Um, what, what's the kind of range of specialization that, that you get to at this stage? Um, I think it's helpful to have a specialization because it gives you something to really sink your teeth in and to focus mm. on and to, to um, build your 
academic profile around. Mm. People will also know if, if we have questions about this topic, we go to this person. That's um, why you're here today as well. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> or some other people who are specializing in the same thing. Um, that being said, <laughs> if you choose something that is very niche and that not a lot of other people do, then you run the risk of your colleagues not knowing where to put you, oh. um, which is a problem I run into because not a lot of people approach fire from a chemical perspective. So I'm really trying to um, promote this this way of thinking <laughs> and get more people to do it. But I mean, I guess most specializations probably started out like that. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of research going on about fire, but people tend to take different approaches. Yeah. Then for what I do, because I study fundamental processes, so just natural things that are, they're always... They always work fundamentally in the same way. Fire mm. is always a fire that follows certain rules. And so is, so the other aspect of my research is uh, preservation. There are certain rules that uh, processes in the soil follow as well. So if you understand those processes, that those data and techniques can then be applied to any other period. Mm. So I could indeed decide tomorrow that I want to research Roman fires and yeah. then all of my stuff can just be transferred. I don't want to do that, but I could, <laughs> I could give, I could give my, my data and tools to other people who would then be able to do that. And I mm. think that is a really, that's the strength of a fundamental research. And you mentioned a little bit of, you know, that, that indeed not many people now are, are doing chemical analysis of fire or, or however you would like to say it. But because I can I can imagine that a lot of people might think that, oh, but someone's already doing that, you know, or oh, that's a very niche topic. Ah, you know, say there's an archaeology student listening in going, oh, I'd love to do fire in, in human evolution, but Femke's already doing that. So that's already being done. Do you think that's a valid supposition or would you sort of encourage people even if other people are already doing it to do the same topic do something slightly different what would your kind of advice be to that that potential archaeology <laughs> student if you're excited about a topic go for it and then you'll find the the thing the question the technique the combination of those things that ha hasn't been done yet and that you can focus on i also think there's a certain threshold if the specialization is extremely niche, there might be five people doing it. And then it, it does feel a little bit like, oh, but they're already doing it. Why should I go in the same direction? If the specialization is a bit broader and there's lots of people are doing it in lots of different countries, then that also, I think, makes you feel that there's more space for everyone. Because there's also so much archaeology that we cannot possibly have one person do all of it. Mm. So it's helpful if we have more of the same specialists um, so we, that we can divide the workload yeah. and also find different questions to answer because everyone has their own, I think, perspective on the past and preferences and different methods. So Especially because yes. you were talking about imagination being so vital. So I can imagine that also has a would be very beneficial. <laughs> to... Yeah, exactly. Developing techniques, coming up with different questions, so they... building on existing work. Those of you listening in who, who want to do this, but with feeling, oh, no, people are already doing it. That's fine. <laughs> Just uh, have, have your own take on it. <laughs> and um, what I would also like to add is don't be afraid of, of the chemistry. If you're interested in, in it, I had no background in chemistry. I took it for a little bit in high school. Then I dropped it, ironically, should not have done that. <laughs> but then I just decided that this, this is one, what I want to do. I'll... I'll work towards understanding the parts that I need to be able to do this. And yeah, yeah it takes some extra work. And sometimes I, I run into problems in data and I'm like, is this very complex or am I just missing some of the basics mm. that would have made this an easy solution? <laughs> uh. But you can always work through that. There's literature, there's other specialists that you can talk to. So yeah, if you want to do something, just go for it. No, I think that that's a yeah. I think that's a very nice uh, <laughs> thing to uh, to potentially end the podcast on. Although I did also want to ask because I understand you're continuing your research into uh, fire with a postdoc. Are there any hints that you have on sort of exciting discoveries or research questions that you're going to be uh, discussing or researching further? So my PhD work focused a lot on method development. So I was in the lab a lot, working with modern materials. 
So I'm very excited to, to start and applying that knowledge and those uh-huh. data and techniques to more archaeology and also <laughs> to explore other methods and other proxies to answer this, the, yeah, other questions about fire. So I'd like to explore um, landscape fire use and see if we can use um, biomarkers, so molecules in sediments, to get some extra information um, about this very difficult to trace behavior. So there's lots of exciting ideas on the horizon. And then now I need to figure out uh, which ones I'm going to do and <laughs> where and how. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. Well, good luck uh, with all of those things. That marks the end of our tea break. It sounds like you've got a lot to, to do. Um, so I, I should let you get back to it. But thank you so, so much for joining me uh, today, Fabka. I really appreciate it. You're very it. welcome. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. And if anyone wants to find out more about uh, Femke's work or research into fire or anything that we've chatted about today, uh, do check the show notes on the podcast podcast homepage. I will be putting up some links there. So yes, I hope that everyone enjoyed our journey today. Very lot. I think this is the deepest we've ever gone uh, back in time. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, no, it was good. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> so uh, yeah, enjoy and uh, see you next month for another episode of Tea Break Time Travel. I hope that you enjoyed our journey today. If you did, make sure to like, follow, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll see you next month for another episode of Tea Break Time Travel. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.